Well, of all the podcasts in the world, you decide to click play on this podcast episode. My name, of course, is Jason Gilmet, and joined by the handsome Michael Glosson. Again, how's it going, Michael? Hey, Jason. It is going great. We have such an intelligent audience. That's It's really a, just a, a, a tribute to their good taste and good looks that they clicked on this podcast. They just naturally assume they're good looking, you know, just yeah. with this audience, they have to be. Yeah, faces for radio, as they used to say. Face for radio. Yeah, exactly. You know, I wasn't too worried, uh, gentlemen, when I first started the podcast, because it wasn't video or anything like that. It was just voice. So I could do it in a t-shirt or a hoodie in the morning was no problem. But then we got to video and I'm like, oh, all right, I guess I'll have to start dressing up a bit. Can't be a nudist Don't worry about my hair. Yeah, exactly. Can't just do it without uh, any clothes on anymore. Today, we're honored to have Reed Summers join us on this episode, of course. Uh, Reed has been working on really educating people on the subject of UAP disclosure, the complications of disclosure, different avenues. He's actually got charts that I was looking at earlier of uh, of what he thinks you know there, there's categories of, what, of where these thought theories can go and again being a chess player i kept thinking reed when i was looking at your stuff it, you know ufology is a lot like chess you can learn the basics but you're never going to master it and the other thing is every time you make a move forward there's yeah. new possibilities now that you have to entertain there's new venues you now have to look at and you're the sort of person that does this sort of stuff that just sits there and like, you know, analyzes and critic. Michael does the same. And it's great because for me, you know, sometimes I get blocked in my own biases and I can't see past a certain point, but I'll talk to gentlemen like yourselves or people like yourselves and like, Oh, well, you ever looked at it this way? And I'm like, Oh, it didn't seem like that far of a stretch, but for some reason I can't get there on my own. So it's important to have these conversations um, about, disclosure what it means are these entities here so reed thank you so much for joining us on UAP studies man i really appreciate your time thank you both great to be here yeah welcome. Welcome. yeah yeah so one of the first questions i you know we would like to know for, especially for the audience is give us a, um sort of a brief history of yourself and what got you into doing what you're doing now with the uap community and uh, disclosure as a whole yeah, thank you um, for the opportunity, guys. Good to chat about this. And I mean, it's it's the biggest issue facing the world, at least in the future, if not now. And I think it's cresting in terms of public awareness. So good to talk about it. Um, as for me, I was kind of born into the middle of all this, this big story called Contact. Uh, and that was through uh, my father, Marshall Vianne Summers, who's the recipient of a set of communications from beyond the world from a group of off-planet observers who he claims... Uh, communicated or reached out to him in the uh, in the mid-90s. And in 1997, uh, after vetting him, you could say, and vetting his ability to receive their communication, he received the first book of Allies of Humanity. Uh, and then the second, third, and fourth books would come over the next 20 years. So um, that kind of happened right smack in the middle of my family. And so I got to see what it means to make contact um, right in the middle, you know, of, of my family life. And so I grew up, you know, seeing that occur and seeing the interest that, that came to Marshall and his efforts to reach people with those, those briefings from these alleys of humanity and, um, and also the pushback, uh, and even the resistance, uh, psychologically, which, you know, we can get into, but, you know, a big focus of mine right now is, um, I'm moving into looking at the NHI itself the non-human intelligence that's in our world and bringing together everything we think we know and everything I think we do know that we need to know we know um, to formulate some sort of starting assessment of their activities and their overall agenda. Um, but, you know, Marshall was the target of that agenda uh, and at many different junctures. So I got to see that as well. So both the positive side of what's possible in, in terms of an individual human being making contact with a non-human intelligence, but also the darker side of touching uh, the agendas, you know, both of the human secrecy, but also the alien secrecy that I believe enshrouds the human secrecy uh, that instigated it, that fuels it, and that accounts for a lot of what we're fighting for today in terms of UAP disclosure. So I've had a long journey. I was, this, I've lived my whole life basically in, in this topic. Professionally, I've been focusing on it um, really since about 2011 um, as kind of 
you know, a side effort of mine. Um, and then I actually just left my career, my 12 year career in media broadcasting. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Six months ago to focus on this because well, congratulations. I, thank you. Yeah. Big step. And I, I mean, I'm a new dad. And so there's a lot of factors involved in, in making the leap to commit, you know, one's full professional life to, to uncovering this reality, but I can feel it and I can feel it coming. It's on the horizon. It's going to be a public recognition of visitation by non-human intelligence is going to rock our world. So for me, it was kind of a series of inner promptings, which kind of, you know, started to shake my house of cards. And then that slowly came down and I realized I'm called, you know, into this field, which I know a lot of other people feel right now. And even recently feel, you know, a lot of people are in this field and they haven't been in it for very long. So they're they're trying to find their way. They're they're groping for a handhold. You know what's real, what's true, um, because this field is is hardly uh, clean and neutral of of misinformation and deception. Uh, it's actually been intentionally pumped full of that to obfuscate the phenomenon and the involvements that it has within our world. So, people stepping into this, it's like it's like a miasma, right? And so, what I feel called to do is to offer some sort of logical framework and and clear perspective that that is established on on what we know that acknowledges what we don't and that begins to move from the vast spectrum of possible explanations for the non-human intelligence uh, their being their origin and their intent and starts to sh to to focus that into more of a, a zone of probable explanations that we can begin to use to formulate some sort of starting assessment. Because without that assessment, it's really difficult to endeavor to disclose this phenomenon to the public. Like, you know, if you're a doctor and you don't know what the diagnosis is for your patient, you don't even know what, what body system their, their ailment is in, how are you gonna get them into your office and, and disclose to them the news, right? I mean, if you think they have cancer, that's one thing, but what kind of cancer, at what stage? And so I feel like we're endeavoring to get this out but we don't really know what it is we're getting out in, in reality, like in terms of the phenomenon. And I think for all of us in this field, we, we need to do better to come to that starting assessment and not pitch ourselves back into, you know, the left and right field possibilities. We have to kind of get center field with this. Um, if we're going to educate the public on something um, that, that could be good, that could be not good, you know, um, and so we have to have some assessment of that. And then from that obviously comes action. Like what does this world of ours need to do at all levels? So I, I see folks kind of scattered across that field. Some are lost in possibilities. Some are promoting action without any firm understanding of what the NHI is and what they've done in our world for 80 years. Um, for example, the whole strong, powerful impulse to take advantage of extraterrestrial technologies. Um, for beneficial ends or for personal profiteering. So, I mean, that's action without a sense or an understanding of the entities with which we're trying to gain those technologies. So my job, I feel, is to help map that field out and give people a, a framework by which they can come to their own working conclusion so that hopefully we land on some common square regarding yeah, what this some, is. Some what place from which we can kind of reason together about it. So I, I don't I I tend to play the character on this uh, show of of the skeptic, which is is pretty easy because that's just what I am, and, I, and it's not. I don't want you to mistake it for aggression because, like, I I um genuinely don't know what the hell I believe about almost anything. It's like I'm constantly floating in a sea of uncertainty and like classic philosophers. <laughs> yeah, just like getting off on my own existential like terror or whatever. Uh, but in in your case, so you're saying that uh your dad was contacted or believed that he was contacted in sort of like telepathic way. Is that the, can you like, just tell us the story of yeah, that? Real yeah, thing? sure. Yeah. Yeah. A big story. Uh, and that's really his story to tell more than mine at this moment. But Marshall developed a telepathic ability to receive communication from non-physical entities early in his career. Um, and so that manifested what was his career. Like how old was he? What was his career? What's that, what's that sort of background? And yeah. He was in his twenties. He was a special educator for the blind. And so he was working with highly with individuals with considerable impairment, trying to, um, work through both like double, like visual and auditory impairments or sight and verbal impairments to help them become functional in life and, and reach their goals. And so he had to almost 
develop his own nonverbal, non-sight-based, non-hearing-based capabilities to interact with these highly disabled people. And in the course of doing so, he not only was able to interact, well, first perceive their communication and their needs, communicate bi bilaterally with them, but also a third kind of factor entered the situation, which was what he would describe as kind of a source of guidance by some kind of presence, some sort of, you can call it an angelic presence, uh, uh, a non-human manifest entity guiding him in his work. That emerged into a whole other teaching, which he called um, self-knowledge and inner guidance or the inner guidance training. This was back in the, wow, late seventies possibly. And that later and later and later evolved over time from something about each person tapping into their own inner guidance to make decisions in life, to actually connecting himself with a set of spiritual, you could say guides or angels even, who began to deliver through him communications regarding our world's emergence into a larger universe of life. And he essentially became a conduit um, beyond just his own personal inner guidance for some sort of higher level guidance you could say for the world, or right? it certainly wasn't just for him. And so this grew and grew and grew over decades into a, a pretty large body of work, which is now called The New Message, which you can look up, it's at newmessage.org. Uh, and so over 9,000 pages of transmitted communication, all of which is centered on this core premise that uh, our world is an emerging world and a larger universe of intelligent life, and that we have essentially a destiny or, or a, a date with with our evolutionary clock to step out into that larger universe and become connected to that fabric of life. And that that was not gonna happen by our forays into space, but rather by visitation by non-human intelligence, which is what has happened. So that connection brought later in, basically utilizing his telepathic capabilities, um, this group of off-planet observers contacted him in the, in the mid nineties and asked him to receive a series of briefings about the, the extraterrestrial presence in the world, what they are, where they come from, um, what their overall agenda is, and how they're interfacing with our world at the level of political leaders, religious leaders, um, and, and really all levels of leadership, but as, also at the citizen level as well. So it's in, in essence, basically a whistleblower report uh, because the visitation as the Allies of Humanity describe it is, is, an, uh, is an aggressive, competitive, form of visitation with another intelligence, physical, by the way. And we can talk about, I, I actually, I enjoy getting into uh, kind of, you could call it, call it the speculation, but I like to call it the probabilities of of NHI being, like, what are they? Because um, until you kind of know what they are, it's hard to say what they're going to do, right? Or what they're Your, your zone of probability, right? The, right? the one you exactly. have on Twitter. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we can go, there, there's a zone of probability for being, origin, and intent. And we could also start to bound other zones of probability at other levels of the NHI's existence. And, um, and interesting stuff. Definitely, we're going to get into it. To get into just that. to answer Michael's yeah. questions. Yeah, Marshall received these briefings from this purported group of alien observers who do not want to see aggressive intervention into our world and actually want to kind of protect the possibility for sovereignty for the human race long enough that we can become a unified world and ultimately participate in this fabric of life. And their messages were given telepathically to Marshall, uh, who has a pretty unbelievable capability to receive precise communication. Um, and he literally spoke that communication. It literally is spoken through him. He, he's more like, he's like a speaker device versus, you know, a collaborator or it's like a know, radio. Someone. Yeah. He yeah. Tunes, he literally received and, replic and replicating that through his own voice. Uh, so those communications were spoken, recorded, transcribed, and that's what you see in the Allies briefings. And how old were you when this started? Wow. Well, I was in high school. Yes, I was in high school during the reception of Allies book one and its publication. So, and my and I also got to see you know Marshall's early attempts to present this to the public, which at that time was a massively tall order. You know, the acknowledgement of the phenomenon, the visible, like physical nature of it was not what it is now. And, yeah. and also the acknowledgement of the telepathic 
nature of the NHI, how they communicate was definitely not what it is now. And so Marshall had the hardest of times trying to tell people that yes, if an alien force comes into the vicinity of our world, they might try to speak to an individual telepathically versus, you know, physically. Um, but yeah, that was, that was, I was in my, you know, teen, late teens, early twenties. And then I, I took off on my own journey in life and I was living in the Middle East, working in the Middle East. I was off on the world of, you know, trying to go into international relations. And then, you know, the mystery button got pushed. And, um, you know, again, that, that sense of kind of like you have a date, with life or destiny and, and and it's it's now it's you and what is and, it like uh, for your dad to come to you in high school and say i've been telepathically contacted by a group of off-world non-human intelligences and they have messages for me i mean i i perceive yeah. that you're a smart sort of analytic person and there had to be some degree of skepticism or at least confusion about Absolutely. that like yeah. what, what was that like and and how did you come become convinced that he wasn't suffering a, a, a peculiar sort of mental uh yeah breakdown well something? you have to understand i you know i was his son for longer than that like i was his son from the beginning so i i actually remember being a kid creeping up to the door his bedroom door and hearing the the voice of this angelic entity speaking through him not just for an hour or two all day days in a row and then knowing that that would be then transcribed which it was and published like for example one of his books greater community spirituality which is the theology of contact was given in four days it's hundreds of pages spoken verbatim i, I mean not he, not even he's hearing this and then and then like okay thinking or transliterating mm -hmm. it into his voice literally he is a like trans four days you would run out of stuff to talk about like if you were fibbing or if you were and, just and making it up, you know, go check out that book. That book is not gobbledygook. That book, yeah, yeah. a theological treatise on what it means psychologically and spiritually for, for a single human to step into a larger universe of intelligent life. Like it's pretty profound. So, I mean, for him to be able to do that off the top of his head and I, I, I walked in the room, I snuck in, he wasn't reading off a notepad. <laughs> his eyes were closed for hours just and who was he reading it to or is he recording it and then record okay yeah. and then transcribing it himself yeah so, so i mean that was my own kind of confidence like okay if marshall says he spent three hours last night receiving the first briefing of the allies of humanity like okay let's go read it um and yeah. you know marshall if you ever meet him he's he's the most sane kind of guy you'll ever meet i mean he's very grounded so I mean, he went through his own struggle, even to be willing to receive any of this. Um, so he's not, he's not into this. Like this isn't a personal hobby or fascination of his. It just kind of happened. Um, it's like almost like a duty he's been given, right? Yeah. 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 A, a pretty heavy one. That's how he experiences it. Well, you um, know, because, uh, you know, this phenomenon seems like it strikes families and then it follows the family. At least now there's more of us picking up the helm, like listening to what happened to our parents and, you know, yeah. adding our own to it, which is great. But, uh, you know, being a young guy, you were a teenager and, and only that, but uh, just mirror, like, I don't know what it was like at home while your father was going through all this with your mom, because, you know, dynamics and relationships are hard, but if somebody's going through something like that, can't really communicate that well with their spouse usually. And now that you're doing that too, you now you're doing advocacy and stuff like that. Have you noticed a bit of a difference between maybe how your wife is responding to your work as opposed to what it was like, you know, even in the nineties for your mom yeah. to recognize your dad's work? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in slightly different work than, you know, than my father. Um, my, my wife is fully on board with it, you know, and, and put, well, my mom, you know, that's a story. Wow. <laughs> how they met and what she brought into his arena. Cause he, he was not really oriented to contact himself. He he was receiving spiritual teachings to guide people into contact with their own inner knowing, the core of their being, which could then guide them. Uh, almost like, you know, everyone has this kind of like autonomous super intelligence or connection to it that can move through them and, and do remarkable things. I mean, we see it every day in the world. People do remarkable things, not because makes logical sense but because they are moved so marshall was about that my mother patricia she had this what we would call a massive greater community connection greater community meaning life in the universe it's a larger community of life right 
And so she really brought that into his world. And she had connections, you know, with certain people in, in the early days of, of ufology um, that had, that came into her life very mysteriously. It's very interesting how people are pulled forward kind of through this field, despite how unpleasant and even uh, confusing and distasteful, you know, it can be. Um, there is a calling aspect for some people. And I, it's probably has to do with our nature and design and why we're, why we're in the world maybe, or, or maybe right. even past lives, you know, the, and I mean, that's a pretty powerful thing to start to think about, which is that, you know, whatever our individual lineage is, it may not just be human. And, you know, it, you could say that's paranormal or extra extraordinary, but it might actually be normal, you know, in the universe in which we live to not simply be kind of like anchored for the ex your soul's anchored, you know, for its entire existence to one planet. Um, so anyway, long story, but my mother and father came together. This whole greater community teaching erupted um, through them. And, and now, you know, of course I'm inspired by it, but my, my, my job now I feel is to go out and help people make sense, make meaning of what is increasingly becoming public, publicly acknowledged and, and evidential. Um, because my concern is that if we stay in possibilities and we don't, don't, don't get down the line to assessment, understanding, position, action, negotiated consensus, that there really is no pathway forward uh, as disclosure happens. So, um, you know, I know this is real. I know we're being visited, you know, and, and my sense from what I'm developing is that, yes, we are, we are being visited by my own working conclusion, if I may offer it, it may not be others, but that, and that's oh, fine. Yeah, please, please. But yeah, my, my working conclusion, and I'd love to get into how I got there, but is, is that we are encountering another physical species from not our world, but another set of worlds. And they are, they represent a competitive form of life. They, they are not here to rescue us or just to study us. Now, there might've been indication of some of that earlier on, but that is no longer the indication um, based on what we can see. And so, I mean, I feel we live in a natural universe and, you know, species interact, they compete, they adapt or they go extinct. And part of my desire is to not see the, hu the human race go that lower route as we start to make, you know, contact in a very worldwide and pervasive form that's different than the ancient forms of contact. So, so based, oh, go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I was going to say based on that. So, you know, I was uh, always wondering if we're on equal footing with these entities because it doesn't seem like we are. They are technologically more advanced than us. They're psychic. They're able to read minds, manipulate us, uh, make us do things we don't want to do, but we do it anyways. That to me is a superiority. In your opinion, do you think they they're treating us with kids gloves? Are we equal to them in any way? Like what is the possibility there? Like what what are we looking at? We at the bottom of the totem pole or just along for the ride at this point? Well, um some things we know is that they have demonstrated an intent to study us extensively. Um beyond just curiosity, but probably for some sort of programmatic set of goals. So they have an intent. They're not just floating by and just wanted to take a peek or, you know, or take some samples and head out. That might reflect more the ancient forms of contact that have occurred, uh, which I do not feel are with the same set of entities that we're making contact with now. So this intent to study at a programmatic level, I think, I think that's established. Um, the intent to interact, not just with human authority, but with human individual species members, us, that's also very established. I think the neurological, well, the intent first capability to affect human beings neurologically very powerfully established, and also the intent to use that in a in a way that contravenes sovereignty of mind um, and and really overtakes people and and pr produces a very traumatic experience uh, for them as well. It's very difficult to integrate, and that actually uh, has has caused a lot of human suffering. I think that's also established. Now the data points keep going, and maybe some of them are, are less. You know, uh, we have less confidence in them as we go down that kind of long tail. It's kind of like that long tail curve of of evidence. Um, but I think all of it comes to indicate uh, that first off, these entities are not from here. You know, they can go eighty thousand feet uh, in a second, right? They can travel at at Mach levels beyond like 
a factor, an exponential level beyond what we can do. I mean, these are not speeds that would be needed if you lived on the earth, under the earth, on Mars. So I think there's evidence that the speeds and the capabilities they have indicate interstellar capabilities. Um, second, I think they're physical. I'm sorry. You know, I, a lot of people want to kind of like live in that, in that uh, anomalous phenomena, not unidentified flying object. And I know that that term or that acronym was redefined in part uh, to make it easier for government to, to disclose this because they can disclose UAP and that does not mean they disclosed UFO, right? So phenomenon is not object. You know, anomalous is not flying. And play so there's a lot of words. That's all it is, Reed. Play on words. What's that? Right? All they're doing play is playing with words. Yeah. Well, they, they might be lowering the pain threshold uh, for this to get out and, and also be able to kind of manage how it gets out a little better. Um, and I understand that. Like, I think there's there's some understanding we need to have for our fellow human leaders and, you know, military contractor, et cetera, who have been involved with this because, again, we have to know what we're trying to disclose. If it's a beneficial thing or it's just a science project, that's a different disclosure than if this is an attempt at intrusion into our world, genetic alteration of the human species, or even ultimately long-term colonization. Like those probabilities, I feel they're probable. Um, you could say they're possible and that's fine, but those possibilities or probabilities uh, indicate a much different path of public disclosure. And so I, I think that's why we need to kind of like start to land somewhere um, because then that informs how this is going to roll out. Um, but it's it's going to be it's going to be really big for people to process. Um, and anyway, so um, back to the the UAP acronym, um, I think what it's also done unfortunately is it's pitched us back into you know everything that might be possible that's anomalous. And there, there are capabilities of the NHI which might make us think they have non-physical uh, techno like technology to to move in non-physical, non-physics-based ways, aka interdimensionally. Um, there is this psychological force that they can generate, which might take on like the almost like an apparition or like a, a non-human visitation. So there are all these aspects to their capabilities. But that does not necessarily mean that the being, their, their nature and being is outside of our physical dimension. So I think it, I think back to my working conclusion, um, this is species to species interaction in a universe that represents nature. And we have to treat it first at that level, not because I, I or we know it's true without a doubt or that there are other possibilities, but because it's responsible given the imbalance of capability being demonstrated by these visitors and the vulnerabilities of our human species being highly divided, highly distracted, um, and having really no secure barrier between the, the surface of the world and space. So we're in a disadvantageous position. And so I think it, it behooves us to think cautiously and, and almost to like, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best, you could say. I mean, that would be almost like, you know, take, take a swing at the bat, do your best. I think we can do better than that. Um, I'm not saying to think like it's the worst, but I think thinking of this as a physical phenomenon with implications for us physically that warrants caution uh, and also species protection, I think is really important to start with. So can, can I ask how, it seems like we have these two different categories of information that we're kind of um, swapping between. One is the the sort of public evidence of UAP activity that we all can kind of know of if you like read the debrief or whatever. Um, and then there's this other category of, of information, which is your, your father's experience with these, uh, this, this uh, sort of mental psychological psychic uh, communication that he, he claims to, to have had with these beings. How do those things mix together and, and why should we believe that they're about the same thing? I mean, did, was your dad's message that this is going to happen or like are there are there clear is there clear commentary about like the uap phenomenon within it or is it just like they're both weird and they're both sort of about extraterrestrial so we kind of connect them or, or tell yeah. us how you think the sure, relationship yeah. works I, I understand yeah, i understand your question because it's like on one side we have you know kind of like this aerospace military phenomenon that's being disclosed which yeah. is good and then this massive citizen interface that seems to have occurred and, and is it the same set of forces? Is it, you know, are they related? I mean, um, good question. And, and I think, you know, 
to uncover that connection, which needs to be uncovered, is part of the shift that I think we need to make. We need to shift from increasingly the UAP disclosure to contact disclosure. Let's disclose the whole event, not just one kind of movement within it. Uh, and so I think broadening to that level, we can take in other sources. And I, I absolutely think the contactee abductee uh, phenomenon is is needing to be looked at, analyzed, um, you know, quantitatively analyzed. Like how many people are experiencing this? Uh, I don't think anyone knows. Um, and then, you know, layer up, we have the sighting, you know, the phenomenon of sightings in the world, you know, in the upper atmosphere, surface of the world, the USOs, all of it, you know, some estimates up to 50,000 good sightings a year worldwide. Like that's a global daily phenomenon. So, so we have this kind of ground level individual interface that, that I think there is a psychological, heavily psychological component to. And then we have this physical interface, you know, eye, eyes to the sky. Uh, and then we have whatever the government military knows, can detect, has kept secret, back engineered, and on and on. And so um, to uncover the, the, like, to connect these dots is really important. Uh, and that shift to contact disclosure might help, uh, that reframing. As for the allies of humanity, they absolutely make extremely clear. And that was their goal, was to make extremely clear why it is we're seeing physical craft. In our skies, why it is there? Why is there a government set of government secrecies in the world, and and to piece that together in ways that we wouldn't be able to possibly ever being like stuck on the ground of the world, we don't understand our neighborhood, you know, in space. We don't know what players are out there, how they interact, when things are taken off planet. Where do they go? Uh, how do these these interventions, as they call them, tend to play out? in terms of like their overall program and outcome. Uh, and because it, it's a script, as the Allies of Humanity say, our visitation today may look enigmatic and exciting. In truth, it's a well-played script in our local universe. Uh, and one that does not end favorably for the, for, the, for the species being discovered. And a lot of why that's happening has to do with the value of our planet, uh, its biological resources, its strategic position, uh, which is something we would never be able to account for, right? I mean, I don't know where the trade routes are. <laughs> yeah. our, okay? yeah. So I mean, we do not have the ability to analyze space beyond our solar system much at all, especially, I mean, maybe we can analyze stars and exoplanets, but those are stationary, uh, you know, massive balls of light, reflective. And so can can you can you track a craft as it as it enters the Kuiper belt and goes beyond and then makes a right hand turn and then comes back? No, you, we cannot. And so that's why in Marshall's view and in the Allies of Humanity, what they say is we're going to need some sort of neutral observer to watch this and inform us in, in the background as to really what's happening at, at that programmatic level uh, to help us connect the dots. Um, but you know, in my view, from, from how I'm looking at this, I absolutely think the UAP phenomenon, which is you know aerial, not just now, surface of the world, underwater, uh, anomalous phenomenon, craft, objects, is absolutely connected to the citizen interface with NHI. So, Reed, um, you know, based on that, because you, you had mentioned before uh, on your uh, Twitter video, you had mentioned about government disclosure versus the their disclosure, whoever they are. And there's, there's two difference there. My biggest fear is that there's a race against the clock for the gatekeepers to fast track their reverse engineering or try to get the most as much as they can to weaponize mm -hmm. it to whatever before there's the big revelation, right? Because mm -hmm. then by that point, the cat's out of the bag. But that's really the ultimate goal. It's not them, whoever them are, whoever they are. I'm not afraid of them because I know nothing of them, but I'm afraid of my own species. I know what we're yeah. capable of. We know what Cortez did when he landed in you know Mexico, just wiped them all out. Why? He had the yeah. technological advantage, right? It was also mm -hmm. diseases. You know, they gave smallpox by giving blankets to the natives in America. And there's different warfares that we've always done. We expect them to do that to us. But realistically, I'm expecting this reverse engineering of this alien tech read to be used mm -hmm. on us by our own species. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I think this is the problem of of not having perspective on our species and world from beyond our world. Um, right. Is that 
all of our known knowns, right? You have what you know, you know, and what, we, what you know, you don't know, and then you, what you don't know, you don't know, right? So that, that quadrant, very cool quadrant. So a lot of our known knowns relate to human beings. And so we're rightly distrustful of ourselves more than we are distrustful of the visitation. We're more hopeful of the visitation. It's, an, it's a known unknown, right? So why be closed-minded? Why be defensive? Be open. And there's this very kind of deeply entrenched, it's almost emotional in nature, this need or, or, or tendency to think government bad, ET good, you know, which is like, look at us, but look at them. Look at us, but think about them, you know, and, and that's understandable, you know, looking from within to, to the outside. Um, unfortunately, as the Allies of Humanity have said, it's actually also a very intentional psychological operation in our world to, to promote human conflict, distrust of one another, weaken our, our, our united front, um, and, and exploit those, those longstanding grievances, um, and all of the inflammable points that exist in, in the human space, whether it's geopolitical or, or even religiously, and, and also to exploit kind of our, our unacknowledged beliefs, hopes, expectations of the universe. So uh, take that as you will. Um, I, I absolutely understand as well all the capability of human beings to hurt human beings. It's, it's very well documented, right? Yeah. And so this, this ET tech arms race, as I call it, I, I think is very real. Uh, I don't know how much it's under the skin of what we're seeing right now, um, but I have no doubt it will be increasingly. Um, and this is why disclosure, disclosure is not a neutral event. Uh, it, I think disclosure has a high chance of being weaponized because who discloses when and with the finger pointed at who, <laughs> which is to say, ah, the US government is the one that back engineered this craft. It's the world hegemonic power. It's why is the Western liberal order dominated since you know the end of World War II? Hmm, I wonder why. You know, it's like the material with which to use this against this country in that example is very real. And I just feel like there's people who would do that. Like it's 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 the suspension of disbelief to think we're we're not gonna someone, some state actor is not gonna use this event to point a finger and rebalance the tilt of power in our world. Uh, and so that's why. The way this happens, I think, is really important. Uh, and you know, my goals, if I may share them, I have three goals for disclosure, um, and they may not even sound very disclosure related. They certainly don't sound UAP related, but that's because I feel I need to think bigger than UAP and its disclosure. I, I see that as an event within a larger parent event, and and that's why the parent event is what sets my goals. Um, What's the so parent the, event? The parent event. You could say it's it's the single word of contact. It's it is this eighty year new wave of visitation to our world by competitive forms of life who don't represent everything that's out in the universe. They simply represent the ones that are most likely to appear first, given our use of nuclear weapons, our degradation of the environment, our despoiling of this planet of value. So it's like, welcome to the universe. Sorry, but the first people who come knocking at your door are not the saints and the saviors. They're the door-to-door -door salesmen or worse, right? It's the local thug in that yeah. analogy. Um, and so that's the event. The event is first, is it's not first contact. I shouldn't use that phrase because there have been prior contact events in, in the history of the world. Um, it's this new wave. And it's this first intervention, you could call it, of which there will be others down the road. Uh, leading us ultimately, if we can get through those, to contact with more more advanced, beneficially uh, motivated forms of life. Um, but so that's that's the parent event. UAP is is uh, one uh, manifestation of the presence. The presence is in the world, and they manifest. Of course, they have craft, they have facilities, they have government contacts and agreements that they've made. They have a movement to affect people neurologically. These are all. Um, these are all kind of like sub phenomena, but the real phenomena is the presence. And so that's where I'm focused is I want to know what the presence is. I want to know what it's doing and what its overall agenda is, because without knowing that, you know, it's like you show up at a basketball game and you have a scorecard. You don't, not only do you not know the players, you don't even know the teams, right? You don't even know what color means. It's like <laughs> you're, if you have so little information with which to make meaning, the meaning you make will not make sense. And, and may, well, maybe it'll make sense to you, but it won't be accurate. That, that's the bigger goal. Um, so my three goals of disclosure 
of not just the UAP phenomenon, disclosure of the event of contact are to uncover the NHI presence, their activity and agenda, a unified human response. Imagine that. Hard to imagine, right? Um, and it might be difficult to get there, but I, I think it is something that has to be reached for. And then the third is human survival. And if we can survive, we advance. And then we can garner what we've learned and even gained technologically from this interaction for our benefit. Um, but first we have to make it. And there are indications based on the NHI activity that they are altering what it fundamentally means to be human. Uh, such that, yes, we may survive as physical vehicles or vessels of biology, right? We might look human in 100 years, but how human will we be? And in my so view, that is... What do you mean by name. that? Like, how are they altering what it means to be human? Um, well, if I may plunge deeper in, you know, to... to oh, plunge. To, Let's do it. That's yeah. what we oh, do. Can, yeah. <laughs> Going to the Mariana Trench. I mean, we're, we're at 100 feet deep right now, but, but this does obviously go many thousands of feet deep. Um, the alien agenda. One of the four primary goals, or I'm sorry, activities of this alien agenda uh, is to undertake a genetic interbreeding program. And, and this is part of the message that was given to your father? Is that where this is coming from? It, it is, but it is corroborated by the testimony of, I don't know how many abductees, all the books on the abduction phenomenon, the research that's been done, the analysis of psychologists upon these abductees. So for me, I'm working to corroborate if that's true. I mean... I'll just say as a caveat, I don't think any telepathically transmitted alien communication can be trusted immediately and wholly without corroboration from what we have in the human space. It's like if someone came up to your door and just said something, you just can't believe them, right? You have to account for what you know about your neighborhood, yourself, your family, your house, you know, the house in which you live, to take that kind of visitor analogy. Um, and so the Allies of Humanity is a pretty compelling telepathically transmitted alien communication? Possibly. Um, now, is it corroborated by the phenomena? Is it corroborated? I actually have eight, eight capabilities that I think we need to engage in this process of corroboration and of establishing a working conclusion. Uh, evidence, what do we know is true at an evidentiary level? Observation, what can we observe? What knowledge bases do we have that relate to this visitation? And I think one of the biggest ones is species interaction. It's it's how species evolve, interact, adapt, or go extinct. There's been 4 billion species on planet Earth over its 4 billion years of life. So we're not the only one. And we, we know some things about how life forms tend to interact with environmental pressure, uh, limited access to resources, uh, and, and what ends up happening as a result. I think that's relevant. Uh, the next, logic. I think whatever whatever working conclusion we formulate about the NHI, it really does have to be logical and not in complete defiance of logic. And then plausibility. I think there has to be a plausible foundation for it. It can't just be asking us to just believe something just that's totally implausible. And then last three, caution. I think we have a responsibility to that. Um, instinct. I think we do have human instinct that can be brought on board. And then finally is responsibility to the human species itself. And um, I think it's important to be responsible to our to our human uh, civilization and and our very existence as a life form and not kind of abandon that to, to get on board, you know, with some some sexy new visitor from beyond. <laughs> and so these are capabilities that, that I hold up. I say, does the Allies of Humanity briefings, uh, is it corroborated by those? For me, it is. Um, and yet there's more that they don't say that we also can discover. And so it's not like a complete text upon which to hang our hat. But I think it's pretty critical information. Um, so the alien agenda, you know, if we can get back into that for a second. Yeah, yeah. what's um, the alien yeah. agenda? Well, what is the alien agenda? The big is question. There just one, is there just one group that has an agenda? I mean, Allies of Humanity is, is another distinct group entirely? Right. So if I may run through the basic premise, um, bring it. let me bring it. Okay. So as an emerging world, which is to say technologically leaping and bounding, <clears throat> depleting and degrading its natural environment, overpopulating its world and developing weapons with the capability to not only end its civilization or dramatically affect it, but also alter the habitability of the planet and its biological wealth. Okay. Those four things, that means we're an emerging world. 
as an emerging world, you gain attention. And what gains that attention from afar is a mixture of things. Um, certainly, I think the biosignature that we put off, basically that this planet has life, but not just that, it has advanced civilization that is altering its climate. That is something that is probably detectable from afar. Um, and so there are those observing, watching, well, what is this emerging world doing? What do they have? Are there opportunities to work with them, take what they have outright? You know, it's a different balance depending on which emerging world you're looking at, I guess. Um, and so those observers uh, from afar have deemed it time to come into the vicinity of our world, undertake an extensive analysis of our of our of the human species and our civilization, and have sought to intrude into our space in very specific and dramatic ways. And that is the phenomena that we see. That is the observable phenomena. That is not just one race. It's actually a group of interracial organizations. Now, the allies of humanity call those the collectives. And so they're essentially forces that seek to go around looking for economic op opportunity. You know, worlds that have value, uh, worlds that whose who's kind of like future uh, path of development can be altered beneficially per, per the desire to gain access to those worlds of and the resources they have. Um, our world has been deemed highly valuable, extraordinarily valuable, and worthy of not just study and analysis, but actual intervention to alter the course that our world takes. Uh, and so that it does not pick the path of independence and careful interaction on its own, you know, for its own benefits, but rather interaction with these larger economic collectives who can then extract the value of this world using us, essentially, you could say as a workforce or simply as, as a local indigenous base of uh, sentience that can gain access to the world, that has instinctual awareness of the world, that, 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 that itself can be used. And the allies even talk about how our psychology and our, our psychic abilities as a world are also valuable. They are also a resource as if it's like, if you run if you run a server farm and all of a sudden you can send a pipe into another server farm and gain access to that CPU power, you might want to do that. You can process bigger equations. And so apparently there is some value to our psychic capacities as, as a young nascent race. Uh, and so there's not just one of these collectives in the world, there are several, um, but they all represent essentially the same intent, which is to gain access to the world, steer its direction into collaboration, but really into a sphere of influence in which we are the minor player, we do what we're told, and and we're we're the young kid on the block, um, but and 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 our developmental course uh, is no longer neither our own nor will we remain what we were, which is the original human species before this attempt at intervention. These collectives are not working together necessarily; they're actually competing with each other. Uh, and also, big one, I think this is fascinating to think about, and this is the exopolitical which is that what they're doing in our world, this is per the eyes of humanity, I would have no way of knowing this at all without that, without that whistleblower report. What the intervention, which is this group of competing collectives is doing is illegal. And if we put out any vocal signal as a world, technologically, for example, like transmitted, it will be seen by those observing this and these interventions will be forced to pull out. And so I was, this is, I think this is because we think, okay, it's us and them and whatever it's going to be is what we do together. Little do we know that there are third and fourth and fifth levels of, of, of interaction possibly, or observation in that, in that analogy, um, who could step in on our behalf, uh, or, or tilt it in our favor in some way. And I think the allies of humanity are one of those third, those third or fourth tiers down, they don't want any contact with our world. There's no agreement, there's no ask. It's basically a perspective that empowers us to use human-based solutions to fix both planetary crises, like our environmental crisis, but also this visitation. So the, the lack of any ask, I think is interesting too. That, that helps <laughs> because if, it's, if it comes with a, some hook into some galactic federation, it's like, okay, right. They can say anything they want, but, and then, you know, and sure. a lot of these these channel messages have that. They speak beautiful stuff that we think, you know, matches what we would want for a world. And yet it also deprecates us in our abilities. It paints us as a virus in the universe, as 
as a reckless warlike world that needs containment. These are some of the things that are said in pro-ET messages that are apparently empowering, right? So the, the subtle removal of power in these communications is worth looking at. You know, if you ever come across an alien message, seems nice, looks nice, reads nice, where does the power go? And what is the level of involvement that this entity is asking for? Power and involvement. And that right there, those are two red lights on the dashboard. <laughs> you know, there's a problem. So uh, why if, should if, we believe that we have the ability to, okay, so, so there's all this UAP activity that we have good, fairly solid empirical evidence for in your um, father's communications are supplying the sort of backstory narrative to to contextualize a lot of this in like an exopolitical sense and maybe even a theological sense um mm -hmm. why should we believe that we have the ability to detect um manipulative disinformation in a telepathic communication from a group of aliens and why should we believe that there's that any significantly more advanced group than us would ever try to communicate with us in a non-manipulative sort of way i mean we don't really mm -hmm. do that with capuchin monkeys we don't think well we don't need to violate their rights and mislead them uh, actually michael uh, I, I was going to say interject with what you're saying is that uh, yeah. reed actually mentioned something uh, earlier uh and he was said that the burden of proof is on them for a positive intent yeah so right it's not and, on but, us but, it's on them so yeah and, but, and and you said there's collaboration co uh, corroboration in the sense that like some of what they say can be corroborated through sort of comparison to our empirical observations but how do we know their intent why should we what test could we ever put to them that would sufficiently establish benevolent mm -hmm. intent towards us that wouldn't and be are you thinking of the eyes of humanity or, or any any entity uh, well, let's just say allies of humanity, or if you want to do any entity. Sure. Let's, let's I mean, they, they basically said we can prevent present no physical hard evidence of our existence and our intent. Even if they landed and shook our hand and said, this is our intent, would we trust that then? I mean, in the end, it not only has to yeah. be self-evident based on our own human capabilities, um, but it, I'm sorry, there's a lot of folks out there who want to bail on the human race <laughs> and they want to sign up. They want to sign up and register for, you know, whatever's coming, right? In terms of the NHI salvation, I think we need to stay on the side of this world and we need to we need to act in the best interest of the human species. The allies of humanity advocate that. Not to say that they're that proves them, but um it 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 helps indicate there's a higher probability that their other claims are actually true versus an entity that is painting the picture that we are a virus, our world doesn't shouldn't even belong to us at this point. We need to open our minds and hearts to the visitation. Okay. Anything else that they claim, okay, that, that is not in the best interest of the human species, in my view. Um, and you I could, trust you them more. I trust that second group more because they're at least saying the things to me that they have an incentive not to say, right? That that signals that they're sort of risking something because we might backlash against them. When a group comes and says, we're the allies of humanity and we have a bunch of really good shit to say to you and we're on your uh -huh. side, I'm immediately wondering how I could ever falsify that if it if it were untrue and if they say there is no way i say well we're in a really uncomfortable position now because all i know is the things that you're claiming about yourself but there's no way but what so what about your father's abilities does he are there any like i can think of maybe some ways to test his ability whether he's actually communicating with others is that something that he's he's been willing to do um to to test whether there are actually others on the other end um, are you thinking like a lie detector or a brain scan or something like that to kind of no, prove? No, I mean, I mean something like if, um, if your dad can sort of communicate with them, right? Like in a relatively quick amount of time, like you could ask them a question and receive an no. answer. No, oh, no, he, well. he 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 is called up to receive what they give. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know if Marshall has ever actually done a a bi directional interaction with the allies. He absolutely has with the angelic. It seems to act as some sort of intermediary, some sort of like non-manifest being that kind of bridges the call telepathically. So with that entity, yes. But with the allies, no. I mean, he's he's called to the chair, and there are years between 
those those incidents, uh, and he receives whatever whatever he receives, and they're not they're not they're not taking questions. <laughs> I, I there are Q and A's in the back of the allies briefings, and I have to ask him, were those his questions, or did the allies actually say people ask the question X? Here's our answer. Yeah. Um, well, it just seems like you could you could submit tests like if he could ask questions in a, in a quick amount of time, you could say something like, "Tell us the prime factorial of this twenty-five digit number." No human can pr brain can has the computational ability to do that. If they could quickly give you the answer, that would prove that you're in contact with something that has computational ability that your own brain doesn't. Uh, that would at yeah. least be proof of something. Uh, or you could say, um, I mean, the there's a yeah, there's a downside though here of like you know, I, I think this hard evidence topic is a very slippery slope. Um, an aggressive form of life could solve some really cool equations too and quote, prove themselves, does not prove their intent. And this sure, is the no, thing- but that would be a good step to know that we're like actually working with something that's okay. outside yeah. your dad's yeah. brain, which is gonna be the first thing that most people just dis disregard because there's lots of people who claim that they've been contacted by alien presences and there's it's hard for a normal person to set aside the time to be able to like evaluate whether they should actually believe this or not. Um, and that seems like a really important first step for delivering a good message uh if that your dad's received yeah i mean again though like oh, gosh it's 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 tricky once you get into the, the the thing of like we'll prove it to us we'll prove it to us we'll prove it to us i mean we all know evidence can be manufactured i mean who's to say someone who's channeling and the aliens gave him this equation who's to say some deep element of the u.s military establishment didn't give it to them i mean it's it's like you're right. It would it would help, and I, I haven't asked him that question. Um, but in a way, I take the allies to be that kind of back channel recommendation about how to connect the dots that we already have. And so I'm not going about asking people. You got to believe this. You've got to believe this. Without you believing it, uh oh, I, I don't think that would even be their intent. They they know that the vast majority of people will not believe them. Um, but if what they present, you kind of like honors the rules of life and sovereignty and free will and renders a situation that is pretty much incontrovertibly in our best interest, it's a nudge. Um, and, and also some of the data points they give about the exopolitical reality are more than a nudge. They, they could be an asset. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot prove the allies of humanity to people. Um, I mean, they can read it and have their own experience. Uh, and, you know, ultimately what they advocate is that beyond like again hard proof data photographic video evidence that kind of thing people have to decide what feels inherently true i mean this is what we do already people live lives based on what they feel is inherently true and so to say you know i could present unbelievable evidence of things that no one wants to be true feels is true and what would that end up doing would that would that convince the world that i that my claims about something else are true you know so they're really speaking. I'll as corroborate they, them. I mean, it, it would it would do it would say something about your character and the and the the way that you think and and the way that you, you handle messages. But if the message is that um, I have I have a a map for sort of huge geopolitical and and exopolitical uh, moves that we need to make and, and information that we need to act upon. But if you're really interested in knowing whether all, the, all this is true or not, you just have to trust your feeling is a, is a is a big ask to put on our feelings. I don't want the right, not just planet to make decisions just. based on sort of collective feelings without questions about truth or authenticity or something. Sure, understood. But and they don't say only. They definitely don't say that's the only thing to base it on. But if I may kind of introduce this this concept that they introduce, which it. is spiritual intelligence, and so basically what they're saying is. Um, and what I feel is true at this point is we are making contact. This is a meeting of minds. NHI, everyone's talking about that. Who's talking about HI? Who's talking about the human intelligence factor? And and if that's unaccounted for, if it's like, no, we got to see it, touch it, taste it. And if that ain't so, it ain't so. Well, guess what? The NHI is operating on planes above and below that. And so if you don't engage other aspects of your intelligence, it's it's you're in, in essence, not, you're not a mind meeting the mind. You're a mind meeting something that's been put in front of you. And, and that can be manipulated. You know, evidence can be manufactured to, to, to reach a certain end. Uh, and so if we relate only to what's been put in front of us, and we we are not even open to kind of this telepathic, uh, non-standard interface that might be occurring, which the allies say it does 
rely on our spiritual intelligence. They call it knowledge or our ability to know. And basically, you know, the reason they bring it up is that the thinking mind has been, it has been discovered by other forms of life, how to not only influence the thinking mind, but in essence, control it. And so everything you perceive, your taste, your touch, your mental imagery with your eyes closed, all of that can be generated by external technologies, but also by the concentration of group mind, which is minds networked together and focused on a point. That's what they call it. Uh, and so this has been discovered. That's what they say. Uh, I think it's pretty plausible. You know, if a bunch of people concentrate on something, could they affect reality or affect the reality of another person? I kind of think that's starting to be demonstrated. And so we're, we're, we're entering this like brave new land territory of the mental, the non-physical. And these beings uh, operate there. And so through technology and through group mind, they can affect the experience of a person. They could even make you um, both, Michael, Jason, think that you just saw something. That you said, no, that was that was in the room. That was in the center. There was a piece of craft right there. And it actually wasn't there. And if others, they didn't want them to see it, those people would not see it. And this is part of, you know, what's behind the abduction phenomenon, right? It's like, wow, people are being taken in the middle of cities, broad daylight. How is that not being seen by everybody and our instrumentation, right? Well, it's because they have neurological control over sentience. Uh, and lo and behold, in these collectives, the lower orders of, of their, their operatives are essentially genetically bred, neurologically controlled uh, <laughs> beings. They don't just hire, they create. They don't just hire beings to do the jobs they want, they create them. I mean, this is like this is like the depth of, of playing God that's out there, possibly. So back to evidence, you know, <laughs> they can make you think you just saw something that was not actually there. They can influence, A, they've mapped, they've done the entire human mind map to understand how we even come about how the, the neurochemical event a feeling convinced of something like, oh my God, that's real. What produces that neurochemically? They know that, okay? And so they can produce mass hallucination. They can produce religious apparition or visions, you know, of, of cherished saints. And this is the problem of having been observed unknowingly for so long and also having leaked our entire human data set into space through, you know, through space-based, I'm um, sorry, earth-based and space-bound transmission. You know, we do not know what we've said the problem is it's everything. And so they have our data set. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they don't have their own artificial intelligences working alongside their artificial beings, right? Uh, and so this is a problem. So between them having everything about us, knowing exactly how we work as a life form, and then having the ability to affect perception, this is why hard evidence is risky. Because once you say, well, here, look at this. Oh, now they're real. And it's like, okay, well, the intervention, they comes in and says, oh, well, look at this. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, now they're real. And, and so what the allies say, and I, I know it's a, it's a hard turn in the road, and, and I can't convince anyone to make it, but basically we possess a level of perception that does not is not anchored in our human manifest selves. Uh, it's actually, it actually is beyond even our soul. And you could call this, you know, Christ consciousness or the mind of God or, or what have you, or gnosis. I mean, similar to what the allies call it, knowledge is this capability to actually perceive and penetrate every layer of psychological, physical, neurochemical deception that is possible in the universe. And so essentially no being can manipulate your mind and affect your perception and so the allies of humanity, they have this deep kind of dive into the spiritual, which is pretty, it's like, okay, why? You know, how is a spiritual solution going to match like a physical event with physical beings, with even with an agenda, like you're saying, right? Um, well, and the reason they say is because you basically have no hope of entering this larger panorama of life and retaining your ability to perceive reality because it will be manufactured for you. I'm talking even what you what you think your skin just felt <laughs> down to that level. And so hard evidence, hard evidence, hard evidence. There's another problem with hard evidence. Um, 
the call for hard evidence places the control of this entire phenomenon back in the hands of those who have possessed it for 80 years. And so if, if the human species is, is incapable of gleaning its own findings through their perception, like eyes, touch, and knowledge, and, and this noetic sense, and it's only hard evidence that's going to work for us, um, then guess who's got it all? And, and guess who's made sure that they have it all? And this is the NHI secrecy that has instigated the human secrecies and that has kept this under wraps for 80 plus years. Um, so that's a little bit of, I mean, if I may back out, that's the alien agenda, the hybridization program, the neurological impact that they're able to, to have on people. I mean, it's it's overwhelming in a sense, like, oh my God, like yeah. if that's possible, people might just conclude we're screwed. And Some it could go might, on too, right? Reed? right. Like it could, it could yeah. just... The rabbit hole could, like you mentioned, you know, uh, you got a species that create droids. Maybe those droids create their own droids and those droids create their own droids. And by eons in the future, you don't know what the hell, you know, like it's their own life form at this point. Um, right. Yeah, I, I love this this subject because it does bring about, we got a slew of issues and problems ahead of us with disclosure. We all want disclosure. I get that. But it's going to come with baggage, like major baggage. And it's yeah. going to open up new doors and new ways of thinking, new issues that we haven't contemplated yet as a species that we'll have to face for the first time as a species, maybe with their help or maybe without it. Maybe we have to pick up the helm from there. Uh, Reed, yeah. you are working on some stuff. You are working on some videos. Can you let us know where people can find you and what you got in the works right now? Yeah, certainly. Well, I'm working on a white paper regarding uh, this logical framework for developing a personal working assessment, which is to say can iterate and change based on new evidence, which it must. And then from that, a working conclusion, a personal conclusion about the NHI, which then would inform action, collaboration, response, essentially. So I'm working on that. Um, I do a lot on Twitter. I, I, I try to watch the stream of, of discussion and interject where it seems helpful. Um, and and I'm, I'm working extensively on a bunch of uh, videos articles, uh, tapping into kind of the various aspects of, that we went into here. So uh, it's a it's a big picture thing. I'm trying to share with people. It's a step back, uh, broaden your perspective on disclosure, see it as a human species to species event of contact and reframe the goals and, and come to some sort of assessment of what it is we are even disclosing. Because without an awareness of that, this will be catastrophic. And, and I mean, it's not a binary controlled and catastrophic it's, it's catastrophic <laughs> until we get more intelligent about, I don't think controlling it as much as, um, <clears throat> specifying and making some positions regarding our goals through all this. I think it is a cause. I think people are called to it and I'm not surprised. Um, I mean, people get activated when there's a necessity beyond them that they're connected to. And so I also talk about that, like what is the personal experience of being connected to this, finding out what that means, taking action on it. Um, and I teach as well a curriculum called Steps to Knowledge, which is a daily practice in coming in contact with the spiritual intelligence, like I shared, um, for the purpose of navigating your life, but also securing your mind in a very noisy, you know, airspace or headspace, which I think we're in. And not finding yourself incapable of perceiving reality one day. Um, I think that would, you know, and I'm sure we, everyone will think they are <laughs> when they're not. Well, first off, it's very difficult to perceive reality anyway, period, right? Let's just be honest. Um, but this noetic mind is actually capable of informing our thinking mind of precise, objective truth, which I think is going to be really important as we interface, not with like a neutral or intentless uh, dynamic, like COVID, for example, or a virus, right? No, this is a highly developed, intentful intelligence. And if they're operating a playbook, which it's programmatic, I can say that much. It's a program. It's, it's This is not a dabbling, you know, sample taking. I think we need to up our game as, as the life form making contact with these life forms. And so um, I also teach what I call a four pillars approach to life. So strengthening um, health, relationships, work, and spiritual practice um, to become a more holistically strong life form uh, in order in some, you know, to ultimately to make uh, the best of this interface. 
nice. uh, because this interface is happening at the individual level. It, it doesn't belong to the military industrial complex. I mean, no. it may want it, us to think that for now, and the NHI may want us to think that too, but um, this is happening at, at a personal level for people. And so there, there's an urgency component to this. Um, people need tools with which to make sense of this. And then if they're being, if they're actually being contacted or, or um, interfaced with directly, they need even more powerful tools to retain their sovereignty of mind in that interface. So those are my projects. Um, and I, I work with Marshall uh, on some, but not all. And I travel a lot. Uh, I meet a lot of people. I talk to as many people as I can about this. And so I collect some fascinating kind of like anecdotal evidence regarding how the population is responding to this. So I kind of try to weave that in and let that inform what I'm doing. Nice. So, uh, basically we're going to put all your, uh, your, your links to your, your website and all that into the episode description. Usually Reed, we would ask you what your, uh, three books recommendations are, but we are going to have to cut the, the podcast short. I got uh, get ready for the second one. We're recording here in a bit. Um, but seriously, honestly, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. It's great to see you step up and sort of like saying, Hey, this is my time. This is the way that, you know, you heard the calling. So, you know, not many people are actually following through with when they hear it. And yeah. I keep telling people, it doesn't take much. Just get off the couch. That's it. Sign up for MUFON to join as investigators. Start doing your own research. I don't care. Just get involved. And that's what we need, right? So a uh, huge thank you on behalf of UAP Studies and the Thank you as for well. being here. Yeah, this yeah, is awesome. For, I appreciate the questions and the hard ones. I don't take them as hostile in any respect. No, I appreciate so, that. <laughs> I get, I get so grilled awesome. a lot. And there's a lot, you know, what I'm presenting is, is it's out there, you know? And so out there requires more to substantiate it. And I totally understand. Well, I appreciate you being willing to, to engage in that level of discussion. That's, that's what we like to have here. So we look forward yeah. to having you on again and best of luck to you.